OK, so let's begin talking about the last chapter of McInerney, uh, where he discusses this intersection between religion and morality, what they have to do with each other, where they are distinct, uh, and sort of looking into, um, especially looking into uh, the nature of his sources. Because he's been, reading, uh, he's been reading, basically, to us from Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologiae, which is a theology text, first and foremost. That should raise questions like, OK, well, if we've been talking entirely about ethics so far, which we pretty much have, why are we reading from a theology text? And how is it that this is a theology text when large sections of it are entirely about ethics and purely human ethics? And so McInerney goes through, uh, throughout this chapter, sort of examining what, uh, what relationship the two generally should have. And then in particular, how did Aquinas see the relationship between the two? So what did you guys think of this? Any general thoughts, any questions you had about the chapter? Anything that we want to go over first? Yeah? Would you say that Mike and Ernie was trying to finally get to this last chapter throughout all of the book? I don't think so. Um, the reason I would, I would hesitate to say something like that is that, that this, is, this seems to me at least, and the way that it's written especially, that this is, this has a couple of roles. And I can see where you might, why you might say something like that maybe. I think that first and foremost, this is contextualization. He's placing the discussion of ethics, particularly the discussion of ethics by Thomas Aquinas, within the context of the other stuff that he talked about and the other stuff that he was more concerned with, right, theology. <clears throat> and so we might say that, especially with like the end of this, right, the end of this chapter, right, right, at the, right when he wraps up the last paragraph or two, right, when he goes to talk about the role that ethical reasoning has to play in the moral life, in becoming virtuous and becoming good, he kind of does this big overall summary thing. But correct me if I'm wrong, uh, or if you thought differently, it seemed to me like that was only tangentially related to the content of this chapter in particular. And he just sort of said that at the end because this was also the end of the book. right? When he was talking about how um, he says, um, Thus, ultimately, the generalized reflection that is moral philosophy must be appropriated by singular agents and made to fit the here and now. Uh, jumping ahead a little bit. Um, if the bent of appetite conflicts with what on the, gen on the level of generality I know I should do, the problem of application cannot be solved by further argument. This is hardly a surprise. It points to something we already knew. Um, the only way to learn to play the harp is to play the harp. Moral philosophy is thus of restricted utility. And he goes on to explain that, that the abstract reasoning about ethics that we have been doing is useful for abstract reasoning, but it's not necessarily going to be the thing that helps us to be good, to act ethically. Because you can know what the right thing to do is and still not do it. Through a deficiency of virtue, through a deficiency of will, through temptation, through whatever it might be, and again, this is another point that I've, we've talked about this earlier, that Aquinas is a little bit shallow on his answer to why is it that we do things that we know are wrong. Because he has, he has trouble figuring that out on his reasoning, on his rationale, which that's something else in here that we can talk about a little bit. But I think that that part of it is, that part of it is very summary. That's like summary of the book, here's our big takeaway that, that Moral philosophy, the study of ethics, is important, but it's not going to get us all the way there. You have to know what to do, but then you have to do it. Right? Then, then the having to do it part is the part that actually you know, will get you to be ethical, to do the right thing. But like I said, I feel like that is a bit of a digression from the, the core content of the chapter, which is the relationship between um, ethics and the study of ethics and the study of philosophy uh, the philosophy of religion and theology and natural theology and this distinction between natural and revealed theology, uh, all of that stuff. I don't know if that's a full answer to your question. 
what'd you think? Follow ups on that or? Because I, I, I will say that I think this chapter felt kind of disjointed because of that. Because he was having to discuss something in particular and then also do sort of wrapping up the book, it seemed like. Yeah. But he almost could have had, seems to me at least, he could have elaborated on this a little bit more on the connection between ethics and religion and then had a separate like epilogue or postscript. Here's a big summary of what we've learned, that kind of thing. Well, I mean, if you look, right? Okay, I'll use the one up here so we can all look here. Um, I think we can probably just draw a line as to where he switches from talking about the last chapter to then going on to wrapping up the book. Um, but the, the, there it is. <laughs> there's, even a, there's even a gap. Right? There's, an extra, there's an extra space between the paragraphs. Um, yeah, I would say that these, well, yeah, I would say that these last three or four pages, really after here on page 123, that this part is more or less wrapping up the book, and before here is the discussion in more precise detail of the relationship between religion and morality. Right. So I think that in this chapter, now maybe this is an editor thing, maybe this is a publisher thing, that they didn't want an extra chapter at the end being sort of just in summary, here's my thoughts on the matter, or in summary, here's what we've discussed. Um, and I will say, in part because this is an academic text and you don't want a chapter that seems superfluous like that. Because then I probably wouldn't teach it as its own class period, right? Um, the, the purpose of a book like this is topic by topic by topic by topic. And if you have something like the end of this chapter that is just sort of a summary of what we've learned so far, that's not its own topic. That's just an attempt at a summary. Right? And so it kind of gets squished together with the discussion of religion and morality. At least that's maybe what I think is going on. So would you say it's kind of like set up like Lewis's, uh, C.S. Lewis abolition of or it was like three chapters and then it was just their own topic, more or less? Yeah, um, that, because what Lewis was, was at least trying to do was to start with a topic, broaden it out to a separate topic, but kind of keep relating back to what he's done before and then broaden it out to a third topic, keep relating it back to what's, what came before. <clears throat> it is notable that I don't think Lewis did this, did this sort of thing in The Abolition of Man. Right? In that book, the ending is really distinct from the beginning. Like by the third chapter, he isn't even talking about the green book anymore, that book he was criticizing. Right? So he has gone in a completely different direction because he's going this topic, that topic, that topic, um, building on the concepts that, we, that they've talked about, but not really the same, the same particular concrete ideas. Right? Whereas what he's doing here, what McInerney is doing, is wrapping up with this topic of ethics and how it relates to religion or theology, and then sort of leading from that into a nice, neat, put a bow on it kind of summary. This also, I will note, this is kind of what makes me think that this was an editorial decision rather than McInerney writing because he doesn't usually stumble, in my, from my reading at least, he doesn't usually just sort of stumble through topics like this and just meander off onto something slightly different. Um, usually a lot of his writing is very deliberate and intentional and this is the kind of thing that an editor would say, hey, you've got you've to wrap this up but put it in this other chapter. That's the kind of thing that I think an editor of an academic text would do that sort of thing from what experience I have. The original version did end like that? My guess is it did end like that, but it was a chapter nine or a postscript or something like that. I don't know. I can't confirm that. I mean, I, maybe I could. I could ask. I could email the guy. He's still alive. He's still writing. Ralph McInerney is still a writing active philosopher, so I don't know. Maybe I could. Um, I think he's in his 70s. I could be wrong about that. He's pretty old, but he's not like. There are, other, there are other active writing philosophers who are well into their 90s and still doing a whole lot of work. So, yeah. Um, the oldest I know of 
personally is uh, who is still active, not just actively writing, but like traveling the world and giving talks is, uh, is a guy named Peter Kraft. Um, he does philosophy, in particular philosophy of religion and, uh, and um, philosophy of religion and theology and those sorts of adjacent topics. And I think he's 92 or 93. And he still regularly travels the world to give speaking events, yeah. conferences, talks with uh, interviews, things like that. Really? Yeah, you did. Hmm. I know. I'm mixing him up with Alistair McIntyre, who we read much earlier in the class. That's right. Okay. Yeah. That's why I, I thought I wouldn't be. I thought I wouldn't fall into that trap because I should know these things. Yeah, Alistair McIntyre. He is still alive. He is still working. He is still very old. Um, that's the guy who we read the first chapter of his book early in the semester on, on uh, the disquieting suggestion. This whole, what if, uh, what if we abandoned the sciences and then tried to reconstruct them later? Oh, okay. that guy. Which actually, let's think back to that because, I mean, his thesis was that this is what happened to ethics, right? that at some point in our history, we completely abandoned the practice of ethics, and then at some later point, we tried to reconstruct it, and now we're confused. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Has the rest of what we've discussed, whether that's from Lewis, whether that's from McInerney, whether that's from the other, um, uh, the other sort of auxiliary text we've read, has that been in alignment with your sort of foregoing assumptions? Or has it been odd? Sort of summary thoughts. What do you think? Has this meshed or met with your expectations of ethics? Have we gone in a weird different direction with it? What do you think? Any other thoughts on that? On the sort of the general picture that we have been hopefully acquiring throughout the class? Maybe? It's good advice. Yeah. I will say, though, that <clears throat> this has kind of been the secret of the, uh, throughout the course is that um, what we've been reading ha is a I would probably say a minority view within academic ethics. Because the approach here, McInerney's approach in particular, remember from the introduction, uh, particularly to, to this edition where he sort of rephrases it, um, but the introduction to both editions of the book, when he talks about how he gave this really basic uh, introduction to the ethical thought of Thomas Aquinas at a conference, and everyone where it was congratulating him for the novelty of these brilliant ideas that they had, they had never understood before, had never realized, they're never, uh, he thought they were, he, basically people thought he was coming up with something new and he was deeply offended by it because no, he wasn't. He was just saying what everyone should know and should have known for the last 800 years, but somehow it's weird and people think of this as novelty. His point there and why, like, kind of in the context of everything we've been discussing is that what he's doing is, what he's trying to do here, is trying to recover a way of thinking about ethical issues in McIntyre's terms, pre-cataclysm. Before we sort of stopped thinking about ethics in this way and started trying to think about ethics in some kind of way that imitates it, but imitates it poorly.
notice, I've skipped over the whole discussion of ethics and religion, at least for the time being, and I've got caught in the same trap that McInerney gets caught in of summarizing the whole thing. So, well, that's fine. <laughs> we'll start with that, and then we'll come back to the topic. Um, that's okay, I guess. Um, point being, though, right, is that is that so things that we've talked about, little bits and pieces of the ideas that we've been putting together, things like the importance of the consequences of our actions for discerning whether we should act in a certain way or not. Looking at the, so when we looked at the principle of double effect, for example, and we looked to additional foreseen consequences of our actions that were distinct from our, uh, our remote ends. That gets turned by itself into an entire school of thought within ethics. That is consequentialism or utilitarianism. This is the idea that we should entirely judge our actions and the actions of others on the basis of their results. Does it produce good results? Does it, uh, does it maximize happiness for the most people possible? And so what happens in a lot of modern ethical discourse, mainstream modern ethical discourse, independent from what we've been studying, is that we'll pick up a little part or a little piece of what used to be ethics, and we'll make that into ethics. That is, understanding consequences, the importance of the consequences of our action towards judging whether it's a good or a bad action. And that becomes the sum total of ethical reasoning. And it gets blown up to massive proportions. Again, very similar to, there's a reason I assigned everything that I assigned, by the way. Very similar to the moral innovators in the second chapter, especially of C.S. Lewis, so in, when he talks about the Tao or the way. The moral innovator will take one piece or one aspect of the Tao, uh, traditional morality, call it what you want, <clears throat> and treat that as the most important thing, or maybe even the only important thing. Well, that's what we kind of do throughout a lot of academic ethics, modern academic ethics. Because you'll also find things like, um, in addition to, say, utilitarianism, that's purely talking about the consequences of our action, you'll also find schools of thought like uh, like deontology, which is that our ethical decisions should be guided by uh, stable and universalizable rules of behavior. So starting purely on the basis of rules and first principles that, that, uh, that apply like universal laws to govern our behavior. Well, we talked about that, right? Kind of, not that as a school of thought. Like natural law? Mm -hmm. The first principles of natural law um, rules that are either generally and for the most part or absolute, when they are general, when they are absolute, and then how they coincide with the, uh, the, the ends or the goals of our action. So it's one small part of our ethical consideration and it fits within a broader context, but uh, this is broadly the, the, uh, a series of, school of thought, schools of thought mostly following a philosopher named Immanuel Kant. Um, who in a lot of intro ethics courses like this, you'll read some of. So sorry for not including that. But I use this to bring up the differences between how we're doing ethics here, looking at it as a sort of holistic picture versus what you will find today, which is a bunch of schools of thought with regard to ethics, clamoring and competing with one another to decide, well, how should we determine what is ethical? Is it about consequences? Is it about rules? Um, another, another major school of thought, thought is called Ethics of Care, which is, about the, uh, which is about the particularity of the persons that you're interacting with. That in order to behave ethically towards somebody, this is an overall summary, I suppose, but in order to behave ethically towards somebody, you have to understand who they are and what their position is, particularly with respect to or in relation to you. Hey, look, we talked about that too. <laughs> we talked about, uh, about individuating a particular situation such that you understand your particular kind of a relationship to and with somebody so that you can understand the appropriate way of behaving with regard to them. But again, all of that is within a broader context. So why I bring this all up now is because if we take Alistair McIntyre's thesis seriously, that at some point we disregarded or abandoned the study of ethics, and then at some later point, tried to pick up the pieces and reconstruct something, and we wound up with these weird competing schools of thought. Well, 
what seems to have happened is precisely that. We've looked, we've found a bunch of different ways of approaching ethics, all of which are a little piece of some fragmented whole, and we've made that into the whole thing. Rather than trying to understand how all of this works together holistically towards, the, uh, towards something like the end or the ultimate end of human action being eudaimonia, human flourishing, uh, what is appropriate to creatures of our kind. So my big summary thing is, aside from McInerney's in particular summary here, of that ethical, that, you know, ethical science or, uh, or uh, moral philosophy is only a part of acting well, that's important too. We can get to that as well. But that this framework of understanding ethics is a much broader and more holistic understanding of ethics than you'll find in particular schools of thought. Because this wasn't, especially when, uh, when Thomas Aquinas was writing, this wasn't seen as a particular school of thought, either by people who agreed or disagreed. There were contemporaries of Aquinas who disagreed with a lot of what he had to say here, both within his own academic context and across the world. However, they didn't see it as, well, this is the, the Thomistic school of thought, or this is the University of Paris school of thought, or even this is the Christian school of thought, and we think something different. It wasn't that. There were disagreements about some assumptions, there were disagreements about some conclusions, but it was treated as if, if it wasn't as if we were talking past each other. It was as if we were trying to figure something out together. Much like we do today in the sciences. There's not like, a, we're kind of in danger of doing this in some, in some really narrow fields of scientific inquiry. For example, um, quantum theory is kind of devolving and splitting into competing schools of thought that talk past each other, as I understand it. I don't fully understand it, but from what I know, there are competing schools of thought within quantum theory that just can't communicate with one another because they have fundamentally different assumptions about things. So they're acquiring this problem a little, a little bit. Um, interestingly, on a side note, there are broadly Thomistic, like people following this tradition, philosophers of science who are pointing to this problem of, of scientists and philosophers of science starting to talk past each other and not understand each other and devolve into schools of thought pointing to the same kind of issue that we've experienced with ethics, with metaphysics, with a lot of other fields. I don't know if they're onto anything. I really don't. Oops. <clears throat> I don't know if they're actually onto something there. Um, I don't know enough about the philosophy of science to make a, or about science itself, uh, to make a solid judgment on the matter, but it's interesting to see potential parallels. You know more, you almost certainly know more about the natural sciences than I do, so I will, I will take that word quite seriously. Oh, I don't, I don't. Have you taken a science class in the last 10 years? Yeah. You know more about the natural sciences than I do. <laughs> Everything I learn about the natural sciences I learn from my students, put it that way. The last time I took a real science class, like real science class, not like interdisciplinary studies, that focused on one of the sciences or something like that. The last time I took a real science class was my junior year of high school. So, so you know more about science than I do. Same. That's okay. I, I quite frankly, I haven't needed to use much of it, so that's okay. I know some things, like don't mix ammonia and chlorine. That's chemistry, I suppose. Also, household safety, though, so let's stick with that. I know stuff I learned from Mythbusters. I, if pressed, I could probably make thermite. Not that that's chemistry. That's, that's, that is um, highly dangerous chemical engineering done by unprofessional people like myself. Not that I have made thermite because it's wildly dangerous and I'd probably get myself killed, but could if I needed to for some reason. I don't know, melting through something? Probably wouldn't. <laughs> I probably wouldn't need thermite. No, it doesn't store well. You shouldn't do that. Um, it can it can corrode and decay. Uh, best case scenario. Worst case scenario, it can self ignite, and then melt through your floor. 
that burns at several thousand degrees and can melt stone. Side note, um, there's, there's a, a YouTube channel I follow, which is I, what feels to me like the, the spiritual successor to the Mythbusters. Um, the, the channel is, is called The Backyard Scientist. Perfect embodiment of Florida Man. Uh, he made a squirt gun that fires molten aluminum. <laughs> Don't do this. He was very cool. Anyway, I digress. That's the kind of science I know, which isn't much. Not to say much. <clears throat> all right, so, so aside from all that, any other thoughts on, 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 well, first of all, anything we've just been talking about, aside from me not knowing science, but this, this, this McIntyreade, if you will, the, uh, the issue of, uh, of this school of thought in particular doing what it does, or if not, what else from the chapter? What else do we have to bring up here? What else do we have to discuss? What else do we think? Yeah, so this is uh, around here, give or take. So he points out a couple of things. First of all, <clears throat> I, I mentioned when we did the whole taxonomy of virtues thing that in addition to the various character virtues and intellectual virtues we talk about, there are also the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love, or charity. And that these are, uh, on Thomas Aquinas' model, they have to be supernaturally infused. They are a gift of grace. Like faith, hope, and love are something that we cannot achieve through our own moral efforts. It's not something that we sort of naturally have according to our nature. It is something that is in addition to, uh, in addition to our own moral efforts. It would have to be. Um, sees this as a, a gift from God. But then also, something I didn't mention then, maybe I mentioned it, but then I said, we'll talk about that later, and waved my hands wildly, um, was that in addition to these strictly theological virtues, which have as their object religious ends, broadly speaking, we also have what Aquinas calls the infused character virtues. These are, again, gifts of grace. If they exist at all, they have to come from the divine source. And these are a, a different and heightened version of all of the various character virtues. So if you take the, the big four cardinal virtues, prudence, justice, courage, and, uh, and moderation or temperance, <clears throat> You have those four, right? But you also have the theological version of those four. The reason for this distinction is that the four cardinal virtues and all of the character virtues really are conducive towards a merely this worldly limited version of happiness. Human flourishing in our mere, uh, in our mere, mere humanity, not directed towards uh, what should really be our ultimate end, which is unity with God. That being uh, due to the fact of our being created by the divine and our reflecting the divine nature in some, uh, in some significant ways, that there is some higher end than our, our merely temporal ends that we find and that we pursue. Okay, but how do you orient yourself in terms of character virtues towards that higher end? Well, you don't. It has to happen. It has to happen to you. But then it starts working ordinarily like the virtues, and that's when he gets into this talk about practice and talk about, well, virtue is about acting. Uh, ethics in general is about acting. It's not about syllogisms. It's not about figuring things out. It's about doing it. And so again, that same thing applies to, to these infused virtues, that our, that our inclination towards, broadly speaking, right, our, our recognition of, the, of divine ends, ends which are higher than, than merely temporal human life, is something that we may receive through grace, but that then it works ordinarily like a virtue. Right? You can act in accordance with it, you can take that end as the end that you choose to pursue, or not. And if not, then it diminishes like any other virtue. 
you can reorient yourself sort of back towards this world, so to speak. It's a thing that can happen just because of, because of our nature as you know, animal temporal creatures. We, we orient ourselves through our rational actions towards proper ends or away towards improper ends. Or, I guess, lower ends. Ends which are still good, but of a lower good. I also like his analogy between, so th this is interesting, I think. Throughout the first few pages of this chapter, he's talking about this distinction between, uh, between philosophy and theology, or between natural theology and revealed theology. So what was that distinction? Who got that? Or I guess, there's a lot of terminology for this between philosophy and theology, or between, uh, between theology and faith, or between natural theology, revealed theology. He makes this distinction a lot of different ways, and that's because Aquinas kind of does too. I'm tip I typically will use the terms natural theology and revealed theology for these two categories. So what were these categories, and what, what was the point? What was he getting at here? It was here, um, page 120, and previous as well. This is sort of where he leads into it. This is what he leads into. The other distinction he made was, uh, the other terminological distinction was the preambles of faith and the articles of faith. Any of this ringing bells? Right, yeah, mysteries of faith. No. There's so much different terminology for these same concepts. It's one of the things that, Aquinas does this sometimes, where he just kind of shotguns out terminology for things and he just kind of wildly uses different terms for the same thing. Um, it doesn't happen often, but sometimes Aquinas, of all people, can get imprecise, and this is one of them. It bugs me a little bit. Because he is getting all these terms from Aquinas. This isn't just him being imprecise. This is Aquinas using tons of different terms for the same concepts. Another concept like this is uh, the common good, which Aquinas kind of does the opposite. He refers to a bunch of different and almost unrelated concepts as all having to do with the common good, then fails to define what the common good is. Yeah. Well, he's doing a lot of quoting. He's doing a lot of close paraphrasing. When, <clears throat> and I think he would take that as a compliment, I think. Because um, again, what he's trying to do here is just convey the thought of Thomas Aquinas in a way that you know, modern readers can e more easily understand. Hopefully, more easily understand. So the distinction here that he makes uh, to give examples would be, on the one hand, um, articles, of, uh, articles of natural theology uh, or philosophical theology or preambles of faith, things like this, are things like the existence of God, the immortality of the soul. Um, there aren't too many of these, quite frankly, but there's a few of them. Things like that. Okay. On the other hand, articles of faith or mysteries of faith or articles of revealed theology are things like God's nature as Trinity, uh, the, the nature of salvation and heaven and things like that, the, the last things. That stuff. The difference here being, most crucially, that the preambles of faith or natural theology are things that we can figure out, at least in theory, about the world and about the divine through natural reason. This is what philosophy can do on its own without revelation, without scripture, without visions from God, any of that stuff. This is what we can figure out purely through natural reason alone at least in theory. Again, this isn't necessarily something that we have to be able to figure out or that everyone can figure out or that we can figure out easily or that we can figure out non-controversially, but it's the kind of thing that reason can tell us. Revealed theology or the mysteries of faith or what are sometimes called the articles of faith are things that we could not know unless they were told to us. That God is Trinity, you can't, 
almost certainly can't prove that. I say almost certainly because some, some philosophers and theologians have kind of tried. I don't think it's worked out. The, the general consensus is that that's not an aspect of natural theology that has to be revealed. Same with the, the sort of uh, the nature of salvation, things like Christ's sacrifice. Stuff like that has to have been or has to be revealed. God has to tell us, in other words, if we want to put it really simply. Okay, so we have this, this distinction between natural theology, stuff we can figure out on our own, and revealed theology, stuff that God has to reveal to us. Something that Aquinas points out, and that McInerney here is echoing, is that there is some overlap between these two categories. There are things that we can figure out through our own reason, but that are revealed anyway. So things like the existence of God and the immortality of the soul, the examples I used. Those are told to us in scripture, that God exists, that God is one, that we are, that our souls are naturally immortal, things like that. We, we're told that in scripture, but Aquinas points out and it argues in several places that those are all things that we could prove definitively through philosophy, through analyzing the world, uh, through metaphysical analysis. So why? Why is it that, according to this, why is it that God reveals things to us that we could figure out on our own? Yeah, right? It's because it's hard, right? It's, it's really hard to definitively prove that God exists. Trust me, I, uh, I, another specialization of mine is philosophy of religion. That's a contentious issue that a lot of people disagree about. So, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe we can. Maybe we can figure this out on our own. But most of us won't. And those of us who do, or can, might have a harder time convincing everyone else, obviously, right? So the reason, the reason that God might have for revealing things to us that we could, in principle, figure out on our own is that, well, most of us probably won't figure it out on our own. And why should we need to? They're very important fundamental aspects of reality, you know, that there is a, something like the divine that's kind of important towards a lot of our decision making, towards a lot of our further reasoning, etc. <clears throat> and, if, and if it's going to be incredibly difficult to figure that out definitively through human reason alone, well, yeah, it probably sh we probably should have a hint. It's very helpful. What Aquinas points out and what McInerney is echoing here is that the same applies even more so for ethical matters. For, say, the first principles and even subsequent principles of the natural law. There are tons of things that we can figure out completely on our own, just purely through ethical reasoning, the kind of reasoning that we've been doing all along throughout this course, throughout this book, throughout the other books that we've been reading. All this is ethical reasoning, trying to figure out through reason alone what we should be doing, what we should not be doing, and why. But not everybody can do that. Not everybody will do that. And quite frankly, not everybody has the time to do that. And it's pretty important that you do. So what happens? Well. In addition to there being additional, um, like certain revealed precepts of the divine law, things that we ought to do that we could not know if, we didn't, if God didn't tell us, so to speak. Um, the Sabbath, for example, specific Sabbath obligations, a particular, at least in the Old Covenant, et cetera, whatever, right? particular Sabbath obligations, things like that. Things that we couldn't figure out on our own. There are also lots of things that are revealed as ethical precepts, say the Ten Commandments, most of them, that we could in principle figure out on our own. I mean, really all but one of them, according to Aquinas at least, all but one of them we could figure out on our own. And the only one we couldn't figure out is the Sabbath obligation. Like what day does God prefer to be worshiped? I don't know, ask. That's, that's, 
Maybe that's kind of a trite summary of Aquinas' answer, but that's, that's basically what he has to say. Like, it, Aquinas argues that, there, that the natural law can't tell us that there's a particular day that we should dedicate to the worship of God. Now, it does, now he does think that, that the natural law does say or would dictate that we should, uh, we should worship God because God is the creator of us and we have an, uh, an ultimate obligation to that from which we receive all that we have, etc. There's a big argument to do with this. But that, uh, that like the specific day of the week, if there is a specific day of the week to do so, that's not like something we could reasonably figure out ever. Right? Okay, fine. So, cool. We get that as revelation. But we also get all of these other precepts as revelation. Right? That we ought to honor our parents, that we ought not to steal, that we ought not to kill, that we ought not to covet. All of these other, other precepts of, uh, of the Ten Commandments and the various other commandments, most of them are natural law principles, right? Don't kill, don't steal. It's kind of basic. Like, you should be able to figure that out by the time you're two or three. Yeah. And natural law. Don't murder, technically. Yeah. Now, you'll notice that the precept as stated in Exodus, in that section of Exodus, on the, on the tablets of the law, so to speak, that it doesn't give specifications as to what counts as murder and what doesn't, but other revelations in other laws and other Mosaic laws do. They do go into more detail on that, which is also more detail that we can go into in terms of our own sort of academic study of ethics. We can do that. We can do it naturally, or, or the religious aspect can serve as a sort of shortcut. That, yeah, you can just sort of follow the precepts and commands of religion, so long as it's correct religion, it's right religion, you're not deluded into, into thinking the wrong thing about the divine. That's its own separate danger. It's a parallel danger to the well-formed conscience discussion from last week. Notably. But that following along with the precepts and commands of religion is a good way of acting ethically. Okay. It's not necessarily a good way of figuring out the mechanics of what's right and what's wrong in all cases. It's not a good way of doing moral philosophy, in other words, of studying ethics from, a, uh, from an academic standpoint, from the kind of standpoint that we're talking about. So that might be its own issue. That's kind of a problem, but it's kind of not a problem. Because as he says later in the chapter, being good, doing the right thing, is not necessarily a matter of studying ethics. If that allows you to figure out what you ought to do and what you ought not to do, good. But if you already have insight into what you should do and what you shouldn't do, and you act according to that insight, say from religion, then you're gonna develop virtue and you're gonna be a good person. You're going to develop the right habits of character and you're going to act well, independently of where you learned it from or how you learned it. Right? This is why, for example, um, I will often criticize people who say, well, the, this happened in some essays, and I talked about this when we, were reading, when we were talking about the essays, that the reason we act rightly or the reason we have for thinking that we ought to pursue the good is because that's what, you, that's what we learned as children. No, not from the standpoint of, of uh, studying ethics, ethical science, moral philosophy, because we have to have a justification for it. On the other hand, though, because it's what I learned growing up, can be a perfectly good reason for behaving ethically. It can be a reason for action, because that's what mom always told me to do. Now, you might develop beyond that, probably should, at some point, you should, you, should, you should probably, on the one hand, develop some further insights and understand why mom told you to do that. And then two, your reasoning should be, well, that's just what I do, right? Because you will, you, you will have developed the proper virtues of character such that right action is what sort of happens naturally to you, what comes naturally to you, so to speak. So you don't usually have to really think through and think, well, what would mom tell me to do? Well, 
you kind of know that already intrinsically, just th sort of through your actions, through your choices. So that's that is the that can be perfectly well a reasonable origin point for ethical choices. But it's not a justification. That's a separate question. The point that he's getting to here at the end, though, is that those two questions only matter in the theoretical context, studying ethics, not being ethical. You can be ethical either way, whether you figure it out yourself and then choose to act in a certain way, or whether you're told how to act and you go along with it because you think it's probably right. And so this is a large purpose of uh, <clears throat> a large purpose of religious revelation for the purpose of acting ethically. It works as a kind of reliable shortcut for when we can't or won't, for whatever reason, employ complex ethical reasoning to a subject. And a lot of times we need shortcuts because a lot of times when we need to choose what to do, we're kind of pressed for time. I struggle with this, by the way, as a highly rationalistic and academic kind of a person, just temperamentally and professionally. I have some trouble with making snap decisions. I don't have necessarily the character habit of prudence that I would like to because I want to think through a situation to all of its possibilities and consider all of my options very thoroughly before I make a decision. And so I don't deal with crisis situations particularly well. Ask anybody who knows me quite well, like ask my wife. It is my absolute greatest character weakness, is my lack of ability to deal with crises. Um, I, for example, um, I, uh, I once called her at work, this was years ago, called her while she was at work because I had loaded the dishwasher with Dawn detergent. I didn't have a dishwasher before this. I didn't know how the hell they worked. I thought you just like, you, put the stuff in it and it fills up with water and it agitates like a washing machine or something, right? That's, that's, I don't know. I had no freaking clue how they worked at all. But I, I was like, all right, that's how it works, right? Okay, fine. And then, <laughs> so I called her at work, like, this is an emergency, I need to talk. I called her work phone, not even her cell phone, because it was put away. And uh, her manager like gave her the phone, it's like, what is it, what is it? Are you okay? Is it, is it, did someone die? And I was like, no, there's bubbles in the kitchen. <laughs> what do I do? Because I also didn't realize you could just open the dishwasher and it would stop. Because once again, I thought it filled and like agitated like a washing machine. You can't just open a washing machine from the front. It, well, it's, it'll spill everywhere, right? You can't just do that. She's like, just open it. Just open it. It will stop. But it'll go everywhere. It's already everywhere. Stop it. Just calm down. Like, OK. And then I solved the problem. But I needed help solving such an, an absolutely ridiculous problem because I didn't, I can't, I have an issue dealing with crisis situations like this because I want to carefully consider all of the details of a, of a situation and determine what the right course of action is through careful analytical means. And you don't usually have time for that sort of thing. And so again, there's, there is, um, there's certainly a benefit to having a kind of stable habit of character. That will, that will sort of guide you through the right kinds of actions without having to carefully deliberate. And that's what character habits are. That's what virtues are. But it's also what we can get through early moral education. It's what we can get through religious revelation, even revelation of things that we already should be able to figure out on our own abstractly. But we don't have to, necessarily. All right, anything else in here? I have a thought or two I could wrap up with, but if you have, if you have additional points that we need to bring up, then I prefer those. Yeah. All right, really quickly, a couple of last things I want to bring up here. I don't have really locations in the text I can point us to, but a couple of things to note. <clears throat> I mentioned this briefly, that there is a parallel here to having a well-formed conscience, right? We have an obligation to follow our conscience, but we also, if our conscience is poorly formed, that leads us into ethical problems, right? The same here applies to religion. Religion provides a great shortcut for ethical reasoning. 
provides us with moral norms that we ought to follow if we're getting it right. A couple of things about this. One, this assumes that there is a correct religious viewpoint, because of course it does. Religion is a viewpoint, right? Theology is a point of view. It is, it is propositional. There is, there is, there are truth claims involved that could be true or could be false, but they can't be just neither, and it can't be up to uh, sort of mere subjectivity. And given what he has to say about natural theology, we should be able to figure out whether our uh, our religious truth claims are true or are false. And so this has a sort of built-in assumption that we take religious questions seriously to the point where, um, or in the way that we, we, we have to be able to figure out, just like we have to be able to figure out whether our conscience is well-formed, we have to figure out whether our, uh, our religion is correct. And that's something that we have to do through a long, drawn-out, rigorous process, probably, or there might be shortcuts involved. But that's getting a little bit into the philosophy of religion, a sort of parallel field. But this sort of gives us an outline of how we ought to approach issues like the philosophy of religion, how we ought to, how we need to approach questions of theology, what's true about religion. Well, we got to figure it out. And it's not enough to just say, yeah, it seems right, or it seems right to me, but it might not be to you. Well, that just means we disagree, or it should mean that we disagree. And so again, this is it. it all of this impl implies that if you're going to be taking religion as, a, as something like a foundation for ethical behavior, you have to have a good, a good reason for thinking you're right. So we should take those questions seriously just like we take ethical questions seriously. That's a pitch for the other class that I sometimes teach, by the way, um, which is, which is uh, less offered because it doesn't take the same the same role in the curriculum uh, as this class, uh, at least not anymore. But if it's around, I recommend that sort of thing, a philosophy of religion class.